I now declare the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened in open session that all council members are present with the exception of council member Williams and council member Homer. They will be on Zoom shortly. Our first item is a preliminary agenda. It's consideration action resulting from executive session. Our next item is personnel appointment, senior advisory board interim member, council member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Holmer and I have uh, consulted, and we would like to appoint uh, Ephraim Girado to fill the uh, interim appointment uh, expiring in uh, October 24. Okay. I make that a motion. Second. Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes. Five. Five, yeah. Uh, next item, item three, community partnership update and direction. Andrew. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Andrew Fortune, Director of Policy and Government Relations. So I wanted to bring to your attention um, an initiative that's brought to the city manager and myself. Uh, from Michael Thomas. Many of you are familiar with his work with My Possibilities and his continued work through the community. Uh, there is a new group called Connect uh, IDD and a Unified Cities. Uh, now, a unified city is um, what they are now defining as a city that demonstrates a commitment to improving the lives of its citizens with disabilities. And so when we talk about improvements, we're looking at areas including community, housing, education, healthcare, and recreational activities. Um, some of the benefits that are highlighted um, when focusing in those areas would be supporting our families, uh, the reputation of a city that uh, takes on this endeavor, uh, the economic benefits that come along with that, community building, talent development, as well as data that can be helpful as we move forward. So when we talk about the need of those um, with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, I wanted to highlight for you on the screen there uh, the needs shown in Plano. Uh, this is generally taken out of the averages uh, reflected from a national level brought down to our community. So estimates indicate over 11,000 residents are members of that community. And despite many advancements in inclusivity, uh, sadly only 5% of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the U.S. are actually employed today. And so while there are many efforts to advance those, um, in that community, there are no unified approaches um, like the ones that are being presented to you, Council, this evening. And really, when we talk about a unified approach, we want that driven by not just one or two members, but experts that reach across multiple sectors, our business community, our public service areas, as well as families impacted. So this program uh, that's being brought before you for consideration tonight really looks at um, going through a multiple phase approach. Um, those phases are reflected there on your screen for you. Phase one is an assessment of the city. So if you wanted to think about something similar to this, um, an accreditation process that uh, other departments might go through, uh, would be follow a similar model. But that assessment, uh, this uh, group would work with our city on a client engagement, um, our needs assessment, stakeholder eng engagement. We'd move on to the planning process on best practices and research. One unique uh, element about this group is they've assembled a, a stellar team from across the nation uh, with specific focus areas. Uh, phase three would be an implementation, uh, that's sustainability planning, um, and moving forward with whatever recommendations have been uh, outlined. And finally, the evaluation certification. Uh, the city would walk away certified as a unified city. Uh, reflecting to not just our community, but also the state and the nation that uh, serving those with intellectual and developmental disabilities is a priority for our city. So uh, here is reflected just some of the proposed timelines and dates of those different phases I've outlined. So you get an idea of the scope of the program. It really lasts uh, for three years. So we'd be looking at a three-year commitment uh, should council decide to move forward with this. Now the cost breakdown uh, is shown here, the cohort size. Uh, the idea behind this is that they're not reaching just one city, but that this entity would engage multiple cities, preferably across the nation, that would be taking on this endeavor. And so as you can see, that cost scales downward as we move forward uh, with more cities 
in this effort. And so tonight we're seeking direction from council. Uh, if you'd like more information, if you'd like staff to pursue this, um, I would also note that uh, Michael Thomas has been engaging our business community um, and J.P. Morgan Chase has uh, moved forward with allowing us to indicate their support of this program. So one of our major partners in the business community here and I would be um, confident that a lot of our other business partners would move forward. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Michael Thomas is also here in the audience. So if there's anything that we can expound on, we'd be happy to. Mayor and Council, uh, real quick, I just wanted to mention that um, when Michael Thomas and I began discussing this, this is this is a certification that really is a is goes along with a, a lot of what the City of Plano stands for, which is making sure that all of our citizens have the ability to, to fully engage in their community. And this is a, a an evaluation process, a certification uh, process, an accreditation process, if you will, that is one of those that is the the first opportunity to do anything like this across the nation. But my recommendation is uh, it's always better to go with friends. I would love us, the, the city of Plano, to, to have the opportunity to be the first city to sign on. But I definitely think it's, it's important that there have the caveat that there's other cities uh, uh, associated with this. So my recommendation would be that if the council chooses to move forward, that we, uh, we authorize participation once five cities or four other cities have signed on so that we ha have a known uh, cost aspect for the city of Plano. But we also ensure that this program has the chance to be successful nationwide. So that's my recommendation. Thanks. Any questions for Andrew or thought? Is everybody okay with pursuing uh, this opportunity? Okay. Is that okay, Lisa? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So Andrew, I, I want to know when 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 you're talking about cohort cities, mm -hmm. um, are we at, are we trying to find cities that are similar in size than us, or are we just trying to find? neighboring cities that are, that are adjacent to us? No, and really the, the dream and, and the discussions have really centered around getting a cross-section of cities from across the nation. So uh, while Plano, we, we're the city of excellence and, and we're happy that we have Michael Thomas here and that we've been approached, uh, the, the goal would be not just to reach regionally, but to reach further than that. And, and we may start looking mm -hmm. um, you know, in Texas, uh, San Antonio has been discussed, some of those other cities, uh, but, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mark, if I, I misunderstood, but I believe that the size, um, what, the bigger the city, the better, I think, in, in a lot of ways. I, I think this really becomes a goal that you, you want high performing cities that actually have programs that mirror a, a lot of the things that are going on because in m many cities, they don't have my possibilities. They don't have some of the partnerships that we have. And so this gives the, the families, the, the institutions, and the individuals knowledge for um, which cities are actually stepping up and actually having meaningful programs that actually help the, the um, disability community. And, and to us, that's, that's critically important. So it will be a national program, and there will be other cities that, that we look at and we compare to on other, uh, on other measures um, that will likely want to be a part of this in the future. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, Thank you so much. Next item, item four, is uh, consent and regular agendas. Any item uh, council member would like to remove? Mayor and council, I need to withdraw item I. We will bring that back at, a, at the December 11th meeting. And item five, council items for future agendas. All right, we will take a recess and return at seven o'clock.
I now declare that the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present with the exception of Council Member Homer and Council Member Williams, who will be on Zoom. <laughs> we'll begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Rabbi Michael Kushnick with Congregation and Shai Torah and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge. Please stand. Elohev, Elohev, Avotenu, our God and God of our ancestors. We ask your blessing for our city, for its government, for all of its leaders and advisors. Teach them insights of your Torah that they may administer all affairs, all affairs fairly, that peace and security, happiness and prosperity, justice and freedom may forever abide in our midst. Today, Israel is reeling from the horrific and barbaric attack by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. 1,200 of our Jewish brothers and sisters of all ages were murdered, and 240 men, women, and children were kidnapped. We're relieved that 50 of the hostages have been released in the past few days. El Rachum Vechanun, God of mercy and compassion, we pray, we plead that you return all the precious and beloved people, the captured and the missing, who have cruelly and heartlessly been torn from their homes by Hamas terrorists. We are terrified, contemplating their fate, horrified at the thought of the sufferings of the missing and captured. We plead before you, source of mercy. Be at their side, support them, protect them, and quickly bring them back to the embrace of their families and all who love them. Our Jewish citizens today and around the world, including this city, feel threatened including an attack just last week against our synagogue. God, please help us end anti-Semitism and ensure the safety and well-being of the Jewish people. We also pray to end Islamophobia and ensure that all of our Muslim neighbors are safe and secure. God, please help us to end all the forms of hatred and bigotry so that we can live side by side with neighbors to bring peace, goodness, and happiness to our community and the greater world. And let us all say, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Be seated. So tonight, the Salvation Army Christmas campaign is being recognized for its annual red kettle and angel trees that provide help to the countless citizens in need. I'd like to call forward Lieutenant Marcus Baca, Corps Officer of the Salvation Army of Plano, and Mary Freeman, Director of Community Relations for Collin and Denton County's Salvation Army of North Texas. Welcome. It's my honor to read a proclamation in regard to this Salvation Army Red Kettle Christmas campaign. Whereas the Salvation Army was founded in Great Britain in 1865, in Texas in 1889, the international movement started with founder William Booth and his wife, Catherine, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ directly to the poor, vulnerable, and destitute in London in their mission to love people through their actions. The Red Kettle Christmas Campaign was established in 1891, collects donations that stay local and provides assistance, as well as Christmas gifts and provisions during the holidays to those lacking adequate resources. 
Whereas in 2022, the Salvation Army Corps raised over 89,000 in Plano and nearly 102 million nationwide. This year, the Plano location will serve 1,055 angels and help 335 families by providing gifts for their children over the holiday season. And whereas in addition to holiday assistance, the Plano location serves as a warming station when needed, serves youth ages 5 through 14 with after-school care, provides summer day camp for elementary and middle school age students, and they also serve over 120 families each week from their food pantry. Now, therefore, I, John Munns, Mayor of the City of Plano, do hereby proclaim Monday, November 27, 2023, as Salvation Army Red Kettle Christmas Campaign Day in Plano. I do thereby encourage all citizens to join me and the Plano City Council in supporting this annual campaign so that all of our families can experience a wonderful and memorable holiday season in the city of excellence. Congratulations. Thank you so much for all that you do for Thank Plano. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Munz. Um, as you guys know, um, need knows no season. Need, need has no season, right? And now more than ever, there's many families in need. And this season, there's going to be families that have to make the hard choices. They have to make the choices of either presence under the tree or food on the table. Presence under the tree or having the lights to stay on. So we'd like to thank uh, Mayor Munns and the Plano City Council for joining that fight and to aid the citizens of Plano in not having to make that hard decision, right? They're helping to be able to provide those presents under the tree, helping to provide that meal on the table. And um, we also thank all the citizens of Plano that go pass by one of our bell ringers and drop a dollar in the bucket. Um, that dollar that you're dropping in that bucket is changing lives, and we thank you very much. Just say thank you, and I look forward to seeing all of you out on the next Saturdays of December 9th and December 16th. They will be at a Kroger on Independence, a Walmart on Independence, and spread out also at a, a, a Kroger on Coit Road. So if you're in the area, come say hello, or you can give a gift through their virtual red kettle. I have their QR codes with me. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. We're going to move comments of public interest uh, to the end after items for individual consideration. So let's move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Motion to approve except for item I. Second. Motion passes. Six to nothing. Six to zero. Item I, please. Or do we do we have to do that? It's, we just pulled it. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Moving on to items for individual consideration. 
Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests were received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance to adopt the youth program standards of care for the city of Plano and providing a repealer clause, a severability clause, a savings clause, and an effective date. Good evening. My name is Susie Hergenrader. I'm the assistant director of Plano Parks and Recreation over recreation. And I'm here today to talk to you about our youth standards of care. So similar to uh, prior year when I was here, uh, we served, we had roughly 260 camp programs offered throughout the year this past year um, with close to 5,000 individuals registering for those camps. According to the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, we are considered a daycare. Um, that is because we're serving seven or more children at a time, ages five to 13, who come at least three days a week or, and two hours per day. However, as a municipal program, we're exempt from child care licensing requirements, um, but we do need to meet um, these items listed here under the Texas Administrative Code. Um, one is that obviously we're a municipal program, also that our parents understand that the programs are not licensed, which they do understand that, we make that clear. Um, we do not advertise as a child care operation, um, and we adopt the standards of care by a governing body, which is what we're doing here this evening, um, and that our standards of care provided, are provided to the parents of our participants. And then finally, within the standards of care, there are minimum standards listed with our enforcement methods identified. So those minimum requirements that must be included in the standards of care, which I believe you have a copy of in your packet, include student instructor ratios, minimum employee qualifications, our minimum building health and safety standards for our camp programs, and then the ways in which we monitor and enforce our standards of care. So I'm here tonight to report that we are compliant with each of the criteria that we've just discussed. Um, these standards of care have been reviewed by the Park and Recreation Planning Board and also our legal team as well. Um, and so if there are no questions, I would ask that you approve of our standards of care um, and adopt them by ordinance so that we can be exempt from child care licensing requirements. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for staff? Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a, a quick question, and thank you for that great presentation, Susie. Mm -hmm. um, have we had any incidents in any of our programs where, where there have been, um, you know, adverse situations involving a child? Adverse? Well, so I, I guess situations where, you know, where there, essentially where things didn't go the way we would have hoped for them to go, you know, I, either from a health, you know, the things we're trying to prevent with these standards, either from a health perspective or abuse perspective or anything? Have, have, we, uh, have we had any incidents? Or? So, no, we have not had any, okay. had any abuse situations. Um, we do rely on these youth standards of care to, um, in response to any challenges that we face, but none of that sort have we Okay, wonderful. And I, I just wanted to kind of make sure that our, our standards are working and that we haven't, you know, haven't yes. had any incidents. So thank you for, for this great yes. presentation and that great information, okay. Susie. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Let me open. Open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on that? There are no speakers right. on this item. I'll close the public hearing. Confine the comments to the council. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I make a motion we adopt the ordinance establishing Plano Parks and Recreation Youth Standards Program Standards of Care. I'll second.
Did you, who, who seconded that? Uh, Did you, Anthony? I, I seconded, sorry. yes, sorry. Mayor. My apologies. Okay, I have a motion, a second to approve agenda item number one. Please vote. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Next item. Item number two, public hearing and consideration of a resolution to approve and reauthorize the City of Plano policy statement for tax abatement, thereby establishing criteria for evaluating tax abatement incentive applications, establishing procedural guidelines and criteria governing tax abatement agreements and providing an effective date. Hey, thank you, Mayor, City Council, Doug McDonald, Director of Economic Development. I'm here tonight for your consideration to approve and reauthorize eyes the uh, City of Plano's policy statement for tax abatements. Uh, chapter 312 of the Texas Local Government Code enables cities to elect to become eligible to participate in tax abatements. Um, to remain eligible to participate, cities have to reauthorize the guidelines and criteria to govern the abatement agreements uh, re by resolution every two years. The current policy we have today is, was approved and, and authorized December 7th, 20, 2021, and will expire this year, December 7th, 2023. Um, before the governing body can adopt, amend, or repeal, or authorize, reauthorize the guidelines, uh, Chapter 312 does require the body to hold a public hearing uh, for the proposed adoption, amendment, repeal, or reauthorization. Um, since 1987, the City of Plano has passed 141 tax abatement agreements. Um, currently, the city has 15 active tax abatement agreements. Six of those abatements uh, will expire this year, uh, December 31st, 2023. Um, the last ab abatement we approved here at the City Council was approved on March 21st of 2016. Um, the policy statement uh, before you in your packets aligns now with the new recently ad approved policy statement for economic development incentives. Um, you'll see there are new sections added in the policy statement this year, which includes state enabling legislation, um, our goals that we've defined in our policy statement for economic development incentives, eligibility, uh, the comprehensive plan alignment and infrastructure alignment, um, our analysis we do with our economic impact report, as well as the new administrative authority granted to the city manager uh, council. I'll be happy to answer your questions you may have. Thanks. Any questions for Doug? Thanks, Doug. I'll open the public hearing. Any speakers? There are no speakers on this All item. All right, so I'll close the public hearing and confine the comments. Uh, comments to the council. Motion to approve. Second. second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve agenda item number two. Please vote. <coughs> motion passes six to zero. Next item. Item number three, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2023-6 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended, granting specific use permits number 68 for private club and number seven for food truck park on point acre, point eight acres of land located 524 feet north of Park Boulevard and 940 feet east of Preston Road in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, presently zoned retail, directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city, providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Good evening, Mayor and Council and Executives. I'm Christina Day, Director of Planning. Uh, this zoning case number six is a request for a, two specific use permits, one for a private club and one for a food truck park. It is on a, a small piece of land uh, within a shopping center, uh, specifically a lease space uh, within a shopping center, and the site is zoned retail. You can see on the map the two notice areas, 200 feet and 500 feet that are required under our ordinance. Um, the majority of the notice went to uh, owners within the shopping center as well as the multifamily property to the north. Uh, this is an aerial photograph showing you the lease space outline as well as a portion that is currently parking that will be utilized for food trucks. The Area, uh, this is a revised site plan um, on the lot that the lease space is a part of, and the surrounding land uses 
Again, multifamily to the north and shopping center uh, surrounding. To the east, south, and west, um, there are a number of specific use permits also existing within this area, which I will detail later. Uh, regarding conformance to the comprehensive plan, this area at Park and Preston is a suburban activity center on the future land use map. Um, you can see the very small red area outlined that demonstrates the area of the request. Um, very little portion of the comprehensive plan policy summary apply here, but the description and priorities do meet, and the revitalization of retail shopping centers policy also meets this standard. Uh, the existing private club SUPs that apply here, um, you can see the request sort of in the center, the largest piece. Um, there are four other SUPs that exist within the shopping center, though no, none of those are currently in use as a private club. There are a couple of those spaces. The ones south of the request are uh, currently used as restaurant spaces. Uh, they're not currently um, active with a private club permit through the TABC. So another unique thing here is parking. Um, we've worked extensively with the applicant to provide adequate parking. Um, the lot itself needs 47 additional parking spaces based on the change in use that will be provided through a shared parking agreement with lot one to the west. And that lot currently has excess parking um, to the tune of 97 spaces. So that will be provided through a revision to that uh, site plan and is a requirement of the site plan for this lot. Regarding residential adjacency standards, they do apply to the food truck park use. And the minimum setback is 150 feet from a residential district boundary line, which does apply just immediately north along the property line. So we've provided a graphic here which shows you a distance of 250 feet because that is the restriction that is proposed and is recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, a 250-foot setback based on the proposed area of food truck park, uh, the parking, and the outside dining area. Um, the rest of the private club area is internal to the building. Um, so that is a restriction that is proposed additionally to ensure that the food trucks stay in this area. A 50-foot setback is proposed from the eastern property line. So we did not receive any feedback from property owners within the 200-foot boundary. And citywide, we did receive 10 total responses on this case, um, three in opposition and seven in support. And those are mapped um, on the graphic that you see before you. So again, the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval of both SUPs by a vote of eight to zero. The private club is recommended for approval and the food truck park is recommended for approval with the restriction noted on the screen. Again, a setback, a minimum of 250 feet from the residential zoning district to the north and a minimum of 50 feet from the eastern property line. With that, I am available for questions you might have regarding this case. And I believe the applicant does have a presentation. Okay. Any, any questions for staff? Thanks, Christina. Thank you. <laughs> I'll open the public hearing. <clears throat> the first speaker will be Tommy Mann, the applicant. Oh, you got me. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Tommy Mann, 500 Winstead Building. Uh, I'm here tonight representing Edens. I want to give you a little bit of background on the center as a whole and what's driving the desire to get this Kirby Ice House tenant in place and then try to give you a little bit of a sense of the Kirby Ice House planned use and some of their operational characteristics. Um, Edens is a long-term holder of retail real estate, as evidenced by this center itself. They've, uh, the current partnership has owned it since about 2007. 
Michael Hale is here with me. He's been in charge of uh, running and leasing it uh, that entire time and is a great source of information if you have questions. Uh, throughout that, they, they own 50 acres here. So the, the parking agreement that we have to enter into is with ourselves. They own everything from including Studio Movie Grill all the way around over to REI, with the exception of the McDonald's and the Capital One Out parcels, totaling about 50 acres. In all their time owning and managing this center, they've experienced a lot of the things you've all read about. The nature of retail has changed considerably. Uh, and the move now is to find ways to make the experience here one that will get you off your phone, off your couch, from having it delivered uh, on your porch to a place you want to be for a while. And we achieve that through a mixture of traditional soft goods, grocery, those sorts of tenants that we do have, as well as destination tenants that are a place to meet friends for a drink after work or for dinner, before or after a movie. And so we're excited about the potential of this use in this space to create a bigger draw for the center. And the intention is to benefit all the tenants in the center. In fact, many of the tenants in the center have to give us their consents before we can even proceed with this lease. Uh, our director has had a conversation with the CEO of Studio Movie Grill, for instance, about this. And they're excited because their site has struggled for a few years and they'd like to see some life injected into the center. This particular box was originally a target. It's seen, it's been a few things. It's been an antique mall. It's been a gold's gym. It's a tough spot within the center. It's indicative of what you see along the park frontage. It struggles a little more than the Preston frontage. This piece in particular, back behind large out parcels, is a tough one for traditional retail. We have a couple of small tenants in there now. We're not losing them. We have other spaces for them in the center. But we think this is an exciting opportunity for this piece. With respect to Kirby itself, I'll just try to explain the concept a little bit for you. It's a little confusing because two SUPs are required, but this is one tenant and one concept. Kirby includes food trucks as part of their permanent operation for part of their food service. In this location, we'll also have a permanent kitchen within the interior space of the project. The food trucks will probably only change out every few weeks at most. They won't be different ones every day in the sense that a food truck at a park or something might change every single day, but it is one integrated concept. There are not two separate tenants. It is one tenant that would be operating all of this. Kirby's concept is a relaxed uh, adult atmosphere for food and drink, happy hours, corporate events, dog friendly. It is not an event venue. We don't have a stage. We don't have a dance floor. We don't... Um, program bands or anything like that. Now, if you have a corporate event and you want to have a singer songwriter with a guitar in the corner, that can be accommodated, but it's really a place for people to convene uh, and enjoy their, each other's company. These are photos from the three existing locations that are in Houston where they've been very successful. This would be one of the first locations in North Texas. You can see kind of the indoor outdoor vibe, you know, outside games like beanbag toss and things like that and how the food trucks play into that overall ambiance and what they're going for. In Plano, if you go, be, of course, a, a restaurant is an allowed use, obviously, in shopping center. But if alcohol sales exceed 50%, then you run the risk of being classified as a private club. So that prompts the need for the private club SUP. The food trucks themselves prompt the need for that SUP. It is entirely possible that the alcohol sales here will not exceed that amount. It certainly may not every month, it may not every week, but they know from their operations in Houston it's certainly possible and they need this approval to be able to proceed under the terms of the lease. So this is the specific layout just to give you a sense of how it'll work. Uh, the food trucks are right here in the green area up at the front of the center. There'll be a place for two of them. They'll be right off the sort of outdoor portion of the use, which was partially covered, partially open air. And then the bulk of the building back in blue is indoor and it'll be demised kind of right down the middle and on the left-hand side will be your back of house and your utility areas and that sort of stuff. The bathrooms come at the very northern back there, uh, but it all operates as one use with a front door that you can kind of see there on the southern end. So there were questions at PNZ and uh, there were good questions. It is a little confusing, we admit that, uh, but hopefully uh, it helps that one of your PNZ members regularly goes to Kirby with family uh, when he's in Houston. Uh, so hopefully some of you have done that. Hopefully this presentation answers some of your questions. We would be happy to answer more. 
And once we adequately do that, we would respectfully request that you follow the recommendations of PNZ and your city staff. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's hear all the, the, the speakers and then we'll, we'll come back for any questions. The first speaker is Paul Knowlton. I'm Paul Knowlton. I live at 58 15 Gillum Drive in Plano, and uh, nice to be here tonight. Uh, I've lived in Plano since 1998, and my wife and kids, and uh, it's been a wonderful city. Um, it's been a place of just a uh, great family. Uh, it's been um, well planned out. It's got great leaders. And I was just, when this came up the other day, I was like going, you know, Park in Preston is a almost an iconic location. Uh, and I started thinking, why would we want to put in a basically 23,000 square foot bar with 6,000 square feet of covered patio and then another 1,700 feet of, I guess you call it fake grass. In, in that center, um, that close backing up, two apartments um, where if you have a business that is going to be, and I'm not sure what the hours are, I was told, and this could be wrong, 2 p.m. until 2 a.m. Um, I just, just didn't get a good feel for it. Um, it uh, just doesn't seem to be the right fit for the area. Um, um, I think that... Uh, it's a good concept that they have, but I, I don't know that it belongs to be right in Preston and Park. I, and I, I worry about things, and I, I worry about parking, worry about traffic, worry about noise, and maybe they've got you know some pretty good answers on those. Um, but I worry about noise. Uh, just if I lived in those apartments back there, uh, that if I that would be a problem to me. Uh, so I just. You know, from a location standpoint, uh, Plano's been a great family city, and uh, I just sometimes you kind of think of, you don't want something that could get out of control, kind of being like a, I don't know if you would describe it, maybe a Byron Nelson Pavilion type a atmosphere at Preston and Park. And uh, Preston and Park is just like I said, again, an iconic location for the city, and uh, I just want to see what's right go in there. Um, and so I just felt I needed to voice my opinion tonight on it and um, appreciate you guys listening to me. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Right. The next speaker is Buddy Kramer. Mayor, council members, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I am the uh, managing partner and owner of the uh, Katy Trail Ice House outpost in Plano, and uh, we love Plano. We've been here since 2013, and uh, we're, in fact, we love it so much, we're expanding, and we're <laughs> doubling the size of what we do. We're bringing in about $700,000 worth of trees. We're expanding our kitchen. We're spending four and a half million dollars. And what I'd like to kind of say about that is that we've patterned our business around the rules that were put in front of us in Plano. And that was we comply with a MB uh, certificate from the uh, TABC with a food and beverage certificate attached. And by the way, there's some, uh, unfortunately, uh, I know a little more about this than what there's no 50-50 anymore. The state legislature changed that rule to 60-40. So you have to gain at least 40% of your revenues with a FB certificate from non-alcohol items. Um, 
Our whole business was patterned around that. It was kind of difficult because in Uptown, uh, we initially started with something along the lines of 20%, which actually has grown to a 35% of food items. In Plano, we're pretty consistently 42 to 43% food, and that complies with the TABC certificate. And the rules are for us, and they're very strict. Every time we come up for a renewal of our license, uh, we submit reports every month to the comptroller that show what our liquor sales are and they show what our other sales are. And at the end of that two years, when our liquor license comes up, if, that, if we don't meet that, uh, they threaten to take your license. They will initially come to you, come up with a little plan, and, and, you know, and if they're satisfied, they'll give you a little leeway on a couple of months. But it's, har it's harsh. And we had to do our business that way. And that's the way that it was always put to us out there. We spent millions of dollars on that kitchen. I'm spending a million dollars just on the kitchen to upgrade it. So I don't think it's fair to just have a business come in and say, we're not going to put in a kitchen. We're, <laughs> we're going to rely on food trucks. And, as if you, and if you go through it, the most successful food trucks in the nation do $500,000 a year. Okay, they're going to do three food trucks. So let's say 1.5 million. You just do the math. The most they'd be allowed to sell in alcohol is 2.8. Uh, uh oh, am I done? 2.8 million a year, and that's just not. That's you cannot pay rent on a 30,000 square foot space for that. It is very disingenuous. Any restaurant person that looks at this, there is absolutely no way they comply with the 35 percent. There's no reporting mechanism in the city of Plano. There's no enforcement mechanism in the city of Plano. Right. It's just a statement. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Steve Church. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Steve Church. I live at 5920 Castle Bar Lane, Plano 75093. Um, for the record, I like restaurants and bars. God knows I've spent enough money and time in them over the decades and kind of like to have some of that back. But when I start hearing talk of a, of a bar, and it's bar and canopy, it's over 28,000 feet. That kind of caught my attention because that sounds more like a, a, a concert hall or an arena than, than just a bar. I mean, heck, the, uh, the ballroom down at Gillies is smaller than that, and that place is huge. So what, what dog do I have in the fight? So I'm the old parent. I had my first child at 52, a son. He's now 15. He's at Shepton High School, and he plays football for Plano West. Well, my son's home away from home is Cowboy Fit, and it's not just him. It's all these boys and some girls, but all these boys from Jasper and Shepton and Plano West Senior, they just live at Cowboy Fit. So they're up there all the time, and I know because I'm taking them there, and I'm dropping them off, picking them up, dropping them off, picking them up, okay? Recently, I don't have to drive as much because now they're all starting to get their driver's licenses, and my son goes for his license in February. So the plan, as I understand it, is we're going to mix a bunch of young, inexperienced drivers with a bar that's bigger than the ballroom at Gillies. Service, that, doesn't, that sounds like a lot of trouble to me. You know, the, the concept is interesting. It kind of reminds me of the truck stop in the colony. But the truck stop in the colony is built on a remote commercial location. It's not located next door to a destination that's frequented by lots and lots of teenagers. So I just wanted to express that concern. Thank, thank you for your time. You, thank you. Joshua Nagger. Good evening, Councilman. My name is Joshua Nager. I live at uh, 1324 Kittery Drive. Um, recently just married over a year now. We moved from Dallas proper out to Blaine, a little bit quieter area, a little more family friendly to get our lives started and have kids eventually, hopefully in the <laughs> next year or two, God willing. Um, 
we came from the lower Greenville area where there was a truck yard just right down the road from us. We know that food trucks probably will not, is, is always an afterthought to being at that type of location. Not really your primary goal is to go like, hey, let's go try out the good food trucks over there. It's more of like, oh, I've had a few too many drinks. Uh, I better get something in my system before I drive home. I am less than a mile away from this location. That's something that does pr promote some kind of fear and everything else with alcohol on the road and everything else. Um, obviously, Uber and everything else has done a good job about trying to mitigate some of that stuff, but that is definitely one thing that kind of scares me about starting a new family in the city, something that close to my home, um, and just causes some kind of concern. And that was just one item that I wanted to bring up to you guys for this. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Dwayne Carter. Good evening, Council. How are y'all? I have a few notes, so I'll just make sure I don't forget anything. So, I'm a concerned citizen. I live literally the neighborhood across the street from this location. So it's very close to where I live. The whole thing of traffic, that parking lot is already pretty bad as it is. To add food trucks and another location to something that at that extent, whew, I can only imagine how bad it could really be. Um, and, can, and we just pride, I mean, I've been in Plano for 13 years now. Um, came from Carrollton, I didn't go far. Um, went for a good city to a better city, which is great. Um, we just pride ourselves on our neighborhood. We pride ourselves on our location. That's why we moved to West Plano. West Plano is where we love to be. And there's already the congestion that park and Preston is so bad as it is. I can only imagine what this can happen if we add something like this extent, extent to our location. Um, we love being in Plano. We love the area where we're at. We love the locations of everything around. We go to many places around the area, me and my girl do. It's just this location is just... It just seems like a really bad thought process that could happen with food trucks. I've been to the truck yard. I've been to up in the colony as well. I've been to all that. We, you know, I like to go out and food. I'm a foodie guy. You can't, you know, you can tell by this lovely physique. I do eat my food. Um, I just think that this is just a bad, bad location for what we're known for in Plano is a good neighborhood. And, and I think it's just, it's going to just draw the wrong attention to the wrong area. And that's, um, all I have to say tonight. Thank y'all very much. Thank you. The last speaker is Joe Klingel. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Joe Klingel, and I've lived in this community for the last 18 years. I'm less than a mile from this location that's being proposed. I'm not against growth, but it is not and is not my intention to inhibit business. For me, is location and that the area being proposed is an extreme, <clears throat> excuse me, an extremely high traffic area with generous amounts of construction already occurring, including on nearby roads. Bringing in more of that does not seem ideal. This is a neighborhood made up of, made up of families, not a college town inundating it with bars and having more and more people coming in and out from other areas further congesting it might not be the best idea for people concerned about the well-being and safety of the citizens in the very nearby housing. The concern here is proximity. Yes, we do have other bars, including basically the same one being proposed already in, in existence, but those mostly are restaurants and have some sort of separation from the areas that are walked by patrons of nearby stores. We are not the colony, where they're set up as entertainment venues, restaurants, shopping areas away from residential housing. We have all that mixed into one location at Park and Preston. The difference is that appears to be a very large undertaking near housing and near other businesses that could be affected and threatened. And that this would be in a shopping area with a lot of traffic for families, whether it be a to and from the pet store, the fitness and yoga clubs, the grocery stores, clothing stores. It's my understanding that this would be a privately funded project but it would impact the area around it and the future infrastructure that likely would be publicly funded. I'm not trying to convince anyone one way or another. I'm offering my opinion. 
I'm not sure how many people were truly aware of this project. I just think some concerns that could be overlooked should now be given proper consideration to what seems like a very ambitious project that could have long-term negative effects. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Close the public hearing and confine the comments to the council. Uh, council Member Riccadelli, I don't know if you had a question. <clears throat> yes, Mayor, th again. thank you. Uh, thank you. I did have a question, uh, a couple of questions actually for the applicant. <clears throat> um, specifically regarding this issue about the uh, percentage of revenue from alcohol sales versus other sources of revenue, um, for the existing Kirby Ice House locations, do you know what the uh, what the revenue breakdown typically is, you know, between alcohol sales and other sales? It, I don't know the exact breakdown in all three locations, but it certainly can exceed this percentage. Now, one key difference between those locations and this one and one of the speakers had incorrect, we're not just proposing the food trucks. We also will have a permanent kitchen in the interior of the facility. So we, we know the food sales here will be higher, but... Like I said in my remarks, we don't know that they will go over that threshold, hence the request. Gotcha. And um, <clears throat> it's my understanding that based on uh, Plano City Ordinance, even with the private club, SUP, Kirby Ice House would still have to hit 35% uh, non-alcohol sales as a percentage of revenue. And uh, with, you know, we heard from the owner of uh, uh, Katie Trail Ice House, uh, I believe the zoning they have uh, with a mixed beverage permit, they have to hit 40%, as he was talking about, uh, of non-alcohol sales as a percentage of revenue. Um, is that your understanding as well, that essentially the distinction between the zoning they have and the zoning requested here would be to, just to lower the percentage of uh, non-alcohol revenue that's required from 40% to 35%? I'm going to trust that he knows more about TABC regulations than I do. And from the nature of your question, you appear to as well. But yes, I think the answer <laughs> just learning, right? Yes. Now. yes. <laughs> okay. And, and so I guess what I wanted to ask then <clears throat> does Kirby Ice House view 40 per, having to have 40% revenue from non alcohol sales as a problem? Or would, this, you know, would, would the zoning, the same zoning that uh, Katie Trail Ice House has, with a mixed beverage permit that would allow, you know, up to, I guess, up to 60% uh, revenue from alcohol sales, would, would that be uh, acceptable zoning for the Kirby Ice House? So we're not actually changing the zoning of this property, right? Mm -hmm. it, so it's not that there's two uses in the, in the zoning ordinance today. There's a restaurant, which requires the mm -hmm. food and beverage certificate, sure. which is yeah. minimum 50%. And then there's a private club, which mm -hmm. takes it, you know, food sales down from 50 to 35. And we do believe that the difference between 50 and 35 is potentially meaningful. And it's not a venture that Kirby's willing to undertake without the ability, because they too are looking to invest millions of dollars in this finish out. And they're not For a sure. speculative operator, right? They have three yeah. existing facilities in Houston. Uh, they're a proven operator and they have good data to back up why they're approaching it the way they are. Okay. So, well, and, and thank, thank you for that uh, information. And, and then I was just going to ask about those three existing locations. Uh, do those also have private club zoning? Or I, I don't know if there's, you know, analogous zoning in well, the other cities. Or, Houston, you know, has I guess no, Houston, Houston has no zoning. Houston has no zoning. Uh, yeah. 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 One so. of the locations is in the Woodlands, <laughs> but I'm not, I don't believe, do they have zoning in the Woodlands? <laughs> I don't think there is no okay. zoning. So they're just subject okay. to the TABC regulations down there. I see. I yeah. see. Gotcha. Well, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. Councilmember Horn. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions I have is actually is an issue with, uh, I noticed your operations as um, um, Sunday through Thursday, it was from uh, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon to two o'clock in the morning. And then on Friday and Saturday, it was from 11 a.m. to two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I'm thinking because of the location and where it is with the apartments to the north and then of course housing almost across the street, uh, well, I'm not gonna say immediate, but it is outside the 250 foot range. The hours of closing every night at two, that's, that seems for that particular area, it's not Addison, it's not Lower Greenville Avenue, it's, it is Preston and Park. And I, 
And I don't think many of the other restaurants around there are open at two o'clock. So would the, the owner be amenable to closing at midnight? Because that, I mean, what I'm hearing from our citizens here is they're concerned about um, drunk driving. They're concerned about um, basically the hours of operations after midnight because it is an apartment, of course, in the north. And so I'm wondering, would he be amenable to looking at closing it at midnight, uh, Sunday through Thursday? Just, sure. just a thought there. Yeah, and let me do my best to respond, and then I may have to consult with my client in the audience. Who's, uh, I can pr pretty confidently tell you on the weekend, on the Friday and Saturday, that the 2 a.m. is more important. During the week, I don't know. And at least according to Katie Trail's website, they're open till 2 a.m. across the street. But they are open at lunch during the week as well, which we would not be during the week, which is hopefully some comfort to them to know there wouldn't be competition for the lunch crowd during the week. But, Michael, yeah, it's the, the 2 a.m. Is, is how they operate all their existing locations. So. Mayor Pro Tem. Can you clarify with your existing locations? I think you just mentioned that you have T TABC um, permits. Are they the mixed beverage permits or are they the private club permits? In Houston, I believe they've just got the mixed beverage permits because again, they don't have zoning. What what forces the private club requirement here is your zoning regulations. You don't you don't even allow a true mixed beverage bar use. Only a private club with an SUP, so yeah. they can sell even more alcohol in Houston locations than they can. Here, My understanding is that SUP. TABC has a private club. Correct club license that's different than the private club that we have at local. Is that correct? I think your zoning ordinance actually defers to the TABC's regulation of the private club. I think TABC regulations just say enough food for the membership, and ours is 35%. Okay. Yeah. Well, Paige knows better than I do. Yeah. We're, we're not creating a new use. The use is in your zoning ordinance and requires an SUP. Okay, but why? I guess I'm just confused then why I'm confused now then why the other ones are operated under mixed beverage and they're asking us for a private club. That's why I'm confused. Because they don't have the, the, the zoning in Houston that we require. No, but they're, they could operate under the same license here that they're operating under Houston is my point. I mean, 40, 60? I think the difference, if I might, is that in, Correct me if I'm wrong, in Houston, you don't have the same restrictions on the food to beverage ratio. If Ms. When Henderson the citizens may know. adopted the alcohol sales, they require a food and beverage certificate with it, and that triggers the 4060. If we didn't adopt it with the food beverage certificate, then it's whatever. So it's likely a different standard in, in Houston. Any other questions for the, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so um, I, I wanted to also ask about security. Um, it, that, that's kind of important to me. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. Obviously, I love having defendants coming out with DWIs, but um, as a Plano resident, I, I absolutely think that that is um, not something that we want to be a reputation for in Plano, um, having multiple um, intoxicated drivers, especially young intoxicated drivers on the road, as one of the speakers just talked about. Um, and it seems like a park in Preston area right now has, um, you know, we have multiple restaurants with bars already in that area. And now we're talking about developing a nearly 30,000 square feet of just alcohol consumption. Uh, I'm a little bit worried about um, what are some of the security guidelines or, or um, you know, plans of action that you're putting in place so that we don't have um, more work for our Plano Police Department in surveilling that area and, and 
you know, and creating more drunk drivers. I, mean, I think that's the part that I'm really worried about and I'm very concerned about. Is there more security? Are you guys going to put private um, security guards? Are you guys going to put up security monitors? Um, how are you going to uh, restrict, um, you know, drinking? Um, it, it, it sounds like, I mean, even though you're saying that you're, you, you're going to have a kitchen in your, in your facility, but it sounds like um, food truck is probably going to be one of your main attractions or main theme that, that makes you different from, you know, Katy Trail. But, I, I, I'm, you know, food trucks are not, um, you know, they're, they're transients. So uh, my basic question is about security. So can you respond to that? Yes. Let me try to respond to the various pieces of that. First, this is not just for alcohol consumption, right? It's, we have a permanent kitchen within the interior space. We have the food trucks in addition to the permanent kitchen. There will be food service from all of those within the facility the whole time. Right, so it's not just a facility for alcohol consumption. Kirby is an existing operator with three locations in Houston. They will provide security for their use, and they will abide by all the applicable regulations. To your point, it's illegal for a restaurant with a bar to overserve a customer and send them out to their vehicle. An operation like this one takes that responsibility probably much more seriously than a regular restaurant does. In addition to Kirby's security, within their operation, Eden's, which owns the entire 50 acres of the center and is one of the most well-capitalized retail real estate owners in the world, has its own security and management operation in place for the entire center at all times that will provide additional protection and insurance as to the safety of the operation for both the tenants and the customers visiting not just Kirby, but the entire center. The size of this also is as much a function of the fact that this is an existing building and to the, to the concerns about traffic and those sorts of things. We're not, even, we're not proposing any new floor area here. We're proposing to lease out an existing building that happens to be this big because it was built as a target. We sent half of it into a cowboy fit who is excited about this use, by the way, because they're struggling in large part due to the vacancy next door and the fact that it's not a very exciting place to come. And so it, could they live with 5,000 less square feet? Probably, but we're we gonna chop off the back half of an existing building, right? So hopefully that's responsive to the various aspects of your question, but you're gonna have two layers of full-time professional security, both from the tenant and the landlord so overseeing me, this. So let me ask you this. What if, this is all hypothetical, what if um, uh, the council decides that food truck is not something that they really want, it's, it doesn't really enhance the, the, you know, the, the beauty of Plano, and, and they're only willing to go forward with one SUP, which is the, the, the restaurant bar. Um, what, what would be, um, I mean, what, what would, your, would your plan change because of that? Yes, we would lose Kirby as a tenant. Um, we would have the private club option to go find a different operator but it is integral to their business model in all of their locations. Any other questions for the applicant? Councilman, Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Um, question I have, and you, you, you alluded to it, what is the size of the kitchen that they're proposing inside? You know, because we're saying like, oh, the food, you're telling me the food trucks don't really matter. That's just kind of, it's a cool factor for the patio, but what, what is the kitchen size that they're proposing? So I actually have the floor plan here. I don't know. Do you all still have this thing? Okay. <laughs> I haven't tried it since uh, COVID. So this is the actual floor plan. Not that you can read it. But this whole side of the building is basically demised for back of house. So you bring in storage, utility, and kitchen. The kitchen envisioned on here is now how much of that, you know, all sort of back of house functions, 1,500 square feet, so over 5,000 square feet. Of but, back of house about 1,500 of cooking area, let's call it. Where Prep you'll have food preparation. kitchen appliances okay. and everything. And you actually, I think, refrigerated okay. items. And, and, and uh, the, the main entrance is where it's under the canopy yeah, down? The front door, you can see it. Basically, where the front door is in line. 
Okay, it's flipped around because yeah, the way remains. I look at that would be the back of the building by the apartments, but it, you, it's just flipped. Yeah, this, these are the restrooms back here at the back. Okay, of the okay, I yep. got you. I got you. It's just flipped from the way that we were looking at there. Yep, okay, sorry. and um, you, you also had mentioned, I, I guess, that you your client could do a traditional uh, food beverage and TABC if, if they wanted to, but for the reasons here, they decided to go for the private club. What was that because the threshold of the food service yeah. was well, lower at 35 versus having to achieve a 40 on a consistent yeah, basis? Yeah, the alcohol sales from Kirby are definitely higher. Not only could we have tenants that have typical, you know, food yeah. and beverage, like we do, <laughs> we have several. Right. I had dinner at Blue Goose with my client before coming here, which is one of our tenants, which has a TABC license and sells alcohol, right? They have several restaurant tenants already. This is a little different use mm -hmm. and has a higher alcohol sale, which prompts it, yes. Okay, and, and that's, well, thank you. That's a great lead into the next question I had here, uh, is what, uh, what would your client be willing to do uh, to, I guess, to validate to us uh, in some meaningful fashion that they are indeed maintaining uh, achieving that 35% food sale ratio versus alcohol because what you know and our fault our bad right now they're basically there's, there's no reporting requirement and, and it's really been I think because up until your your client came in proposed this we don't have any private clubs or have it no one's proposed anything like this you know this this type of scope and scale to us uh, what what would they be willing, and I guess your clients here, what would they be willing to do reporting-wise somehow to us uh, to assure us that they are maintaining that 35%? Because uh, I think several of the, uh, you know, the folks in the audience had uh, expressed concerns about having a bar this size during uh, traffic. Deputy Mayor had expressed concern about, as a attorney, you know, generating potential DUIs out, out and about, especially at 2 o'clock sure. in the morning. Uh, and I, I live close to this area as well. I'm by there, I frequent the restaurant thing, and it's it's busy down there. So um, what would they be willing, if anything, to do to guarantee us that they would be achieving that? It's not a 90% alcohol sale. Yeah, so those reports, as I understand it, do have to be provided, I think it's quarterly, to the TABC and verified from actual receipts. And we'd have no objection sharing all of those reports with the city. Okay, that's if, not required by it. It's, it's, it's regulated by the TABC, but... It, we got to provide it to them and we'd be happy to provide it to the city for, so you can see it. I mean, there's, there's no secrets. It's a, a process that's required by law. Okay. Uh, Paige, can, I, can that be incorporated into this application to approve that uh, they would indeed provide those same reports to us legally? Not that I don't trust you, but I just don't, would don't. like to have you know would like trust to have some me, guarantee that that's going <laughs> to that's going to be the case. I guess it I guess it would be simultaneously to us as well as the TABC. Yeah, we would submit to the city the exact same thing we submit okay. to the TABC for your. Confirmation. Obviously, they're the enforcement mechanism on it if we're out of compliance, but you would see the same information that they do. So, so that's a yes. Yes. Uh, I guess that would be For me, we could yeah. incorporate that into, into anything it, were we to approve this tonight. Mayor, Mayor, you're you're in the development side, but you you know you may know more than Uh, let me take a five minute recess.
Re Council's reconvened. Any um, any other questions? Or Paige, do you um, have some clarity for us? Yes, yeah, so we've had an ordinance requirement over the years, um, and it's kind of cross-referenced in some of the amendments that we can require an annual report and it would be due by April 1st. And if you want to go ahead and put that as a stipulation on this SUP to show that they're doing the 35% okay. ratio, that would be okay. Hey, Christina, could you write something up that and then read it to us? Thank you. Thank you. You're awesome. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you so much for your patience. I appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Um, I have one question. So um, obviously when you are um, planning on, or the, your, your tenant, I guess it's your tenant, right? Correct. Yes, are planning on an um, opening uh, an establishment like the one that uh, is being proposed. Um, has, has there been any type of research or survey or, um, um, that was done with regard to this particular area? I mean, I guess the reason why I'm asking this question is Plano is ra very residential. I mean, we, you know, we pride ourselves in family-oriented um, area where you know we go on weekends to go out and, and have you know, food and beverage. But is there has there been any type of survey or research done with regard to how it's going to operate from Monday through Friday or Monday through Thursday, actually? Yes, and. It the research is there are three existing locations, right? One's in the Memorial area of Houston, the Woodlands. Every city is different, but demographically, there's a lot of similarities in those locations. And they're confident that the kind of folks who live in this area will be attracted to this. And like I said in my lead up, this, there's no stage. People mentioned the truck yard. It has a stage and speakers and live bands every weekend. This is a place where you can bring your dog literally, and sit down with friends after work. It's a laid back atmosphere. Yes, it's for adults, but they are in similar locations with similarly established single family neighborhoods in the immediate vicinity in Houston. And they are confident that their model will work in a location like this one. Do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a quick question. So just to clarify, because there's been a lot of discussion about the you know, 50 versus 35 is a big difference, which, which I agree is a big difference. But it sounds like the state legislature has amended that to where uh, without the private club SUP, you could still get a permit that would allow just 40% of revenue from non-alcohol uh, non sales. Uh, would that 35 to 40% be a big, uh, a big deal for Kirby Ice House? based on percentages at current locations, or, or do we just not have that uh, information tonight? If we don't, I, I totally understand. No, it, none of the locations okay. in Houston could meet it. Okay. But they don't have to. They're okay. already okay. having to alter their business model to be able to open here, and that's why they're putting a permanent kitchen in in addition to the food trucks. Now, it's a great gotcha. question. I appreciate okay. it. 5% yeah. doesn't sound like a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I guess you can look at that either way. What's the difference sure. if it is 5% more or 5% sure. less? Would we lose them as a tenant? We're here because they said they need this to operate. If I go home tonight with only food trucks and no private club, do I lose them as a tenant? I think I do, but Okay, I gotcha. Know. Well, and, and the, the reason I ask is just because I think my understanding, and, and anyone, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the, the TABC mixed beverage, you know, food and beverage permit would uh, – would allow y'all to have up to 60% revenue from the alcohol. And that would have accountability at the state level from the TABC. The TABC would enforce that the city would not have to. Whereas if we do the private club, my understanding is the TABC will not enforce any minimum and it would be up to the city to enforce the 35%, which my understanding is we're not currently doing. And so anyway, that, that's, yeah, that's why I was asking if, if, if we can yeah. get it where the TABC <laughs> is enforcing some accountability, yeah. that, that would personally increase my comfort level. We are okay, and we understand, and I could appreciate someone saying, what are these guys doing? They probably want to come in and sell 95% alcohol, and we're never going to check, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we're agreeable to the suggested audit and reporting provision. We're here because we want to follow the rules, not because we're trying to skirt them or avoid them. Gotcha. Well, thank you for those responses. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Okay. Uh, 
close the public hearing. If you if you'll read that proposal. Sure, and I can for us, show please, it on Christina. the overhead as well. Um, the, there's a private club restriction. It would be annual reporting must be provided consistent with Ordinance 79610 by April 1st of each calendar year, and that ordinance does have detailed standards as to what that would look like. It says they have to provide something to the city manager that's then provided to the city council. All right. Thank you. Um, call to question. Uh, anybody? Uh, we, we've asked all the questions we can. Anthony? Oh, I, I just was going to make a comment, Mayor. Uh, I, I appreciate the application and um, you know, I actually grew up in the neighborhood that was right across Ohio from there. Uh, when I got old enough to ride my bike across Ohio, rode my bike there. So I, I do, uh, I do think there, you know, there are kids who are who are around this. Uh, but you know, there's already across the street a Katie Trail Ice House. There's, uh, um, you know, other uh, clearly other SUPs. If this were for the forty percent, uh, you know, th that permit that where the TABC would, would enforce the accountability for the 40% instead of the city having to do that, I, I would be okay with that because that, that's the same rules that Katy Trail Ice House is operating under. I don't want zoning to be a barrier to entry to prevent competition for established businesses. That's not the purpose of zoning. So I would be, I would be happy to provide the same zoning that Katy Trail Ice House has because that's only fair. But, um, you, you know, for me, uh, I, I just I think we're better off since we are not currently enforcing the 35% requirement for private clubs. I understand you know this annual report option, but I still think it's just better to leave it with the the food and beverage permit where the TABC you know who does this every day would be enforcing that at the state level. Um, so if if y'all came back with that zoning request, I would vote for it. Um, but I, I can't vote for this tonight. So th thank y'all uh, for the application though. Yeah. Councilman Regali, uh, are you comfortable with that? Because one thing that I was kind of, uh, I guess, put off a little bit about as being uh, an unfair to existing business was a 35%. But what I think what we're putting in there tonight is uh, they would agree to abide by annual reporting to us that they are meeting that 35% 35% threshold because the, the, the current state threshold, I believe, is 40% now, not 50%. So it's, it's that 5% difference that, that you're talking about. So would that make you feel better about it or worse or about the same? Oh, well, well, thank you for asking. You know, I mean, I, I think w your change is a very positive one about the reporting because one of my concerns was that the city is not currently enforcing this. But, you know, given that, I, I just think, you know, if the business model is being modified to get to 35 percent, you know, I understand, you know, 35 to 40 sounds small to me. I'm sure from a business perspective, it's a bigger change than, um, you know, than it's than it's sounding, you know, the difference between those numbers. But I I just think we're better off, you know, um, letting the TABC do what the TABC does, you know, leaving this something where, where there would be a state requirement that, that would be enforced by the people who enforce these types of regulations every day that, um, that, that, that there has to be 40% revenue from, uh, from non-alcohol sales. So I, I you know, I, I just, I, th I think we're better off leaving it with, you know, you know, if, if, if there's to be rezoning the same zoning that Katie Trail Ice House has, um, that seems to be working there, and, and it would be fair to everyone for them to have the exact same zoning. I agree with uh, Council Member Riccadelli. I don't think we need to get into this having to have a report to the manager and to us to be monitoring their alcohol use. I think that's what the TABC is there for, and so um, I'm in support if they want to come back with um, having it monitored through the TABC, but I don't think we need to get into that. So I'm unfortunately not going to be able to support this. I'm sorry, I, I'd like to chime in too. Um, there's one thing I, I, I believe that um, uh, the applicant talked about was that this is going to be for adults only. And um, <coughs> I, I don't think that really fits into Plano policy. I mean, we're, we're family oriented. Um, place where we want to bring our kids to um, different entertainments and different variety of um, places for shopping and for food and for entertainment. So I, I, I'm actually stuck on that too. Um, you know, dogs are allowed, but kids are not allowed. Um, doesn't fit with me. So I, I'm going to sort of follow along with that. 
Julie, do you, do you have a comment? No, my fellow council members and uh, some of the speakers, I think, covered up all of my questions and concerns very well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm really uh, at a crossroads here in that the proposal meets the comp plan for an activity center. It does, you know, um, it, it meets creating destination shopping and an entertainment center. It meets the matrices for um, um, mixture of uses. Um, SUP is compliant with the setbacks. Uh, everything, everything's great about this. I wish this thing was in only thing. I wish it was closer to where I live instead of on uh, where everything where you guys live. But I do have a problem with it being larger than Gillies, Dallas, and that is a that's where I'm having a hiccup. Um, I, I got to tell you, 32,000 square feet and, you know, you got 1,500 square feet of kitchen. You have about 5,000 square feet of back of room, I guess, is what the total amount was. That's a lot of space to put patrons to have beverages and have just really not a lot of food. So that's really where I'm having an issue. It's just the sheer size of this. So... Uh, this is where I'm, I'm troubled. I'd love to see you there. If it was a smaller footprint, maybe that might be an answer, but I'm sure that doesn't meet your business model. So um, I'll have to vote against this. Go ahead. You, you guys have a motion. Make a motion that we deny the petition. And I respect. I will respectfully second. Mayor, before we go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, before we call it, I was just going to say, uh, I think everybody can do math. Uh, this is not going to turn out probably the way you had wanted it to turn out. But I would suggest if if you can, as we'd asked earlier, come back as a traditional restaurant, you know, beverage, alcohol establishment. I think that might be viewed a little bit favor as Councilman Riccadelli had just mentioned. So just don't be totally you know, out what? just because it may not work tonight. Be out of order for me to ask a question. No, you're fine. It, it's just two SUPs. So obviously, if you're disinclined on the private club, the food truck is a separate vote, and we could go to Kirby and see if they're able to operate at the 40 level, and they would still need the SUP huh? for the food trucks. Or yeah, so I just wanted to put that up. We no, area. I'm not we, trying to retry my case. I think that's our biggest issue is to that we, we'd like you to have a, a, a restaurant bar in one facility and not in, have yeah. the, the, the food truck part of it. If, so, If um, we get the food truck approval, we at least have the opportunity to yeah. go to this tenant and say, yeah. if you can get to 40, we got you your food trucks. That's all I'm saying. Oh, you want to do it the other way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I don't, I'd love for you to vote for the private club, but I'll see that happen. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll, I'll, I'll just say personally, and I don't want to complicate the issue, but given the request from the applicant, the, the food truck park is, is not my concern. It's the, it's the going below 40% uh, revenue from, from non-alcohol sales. So I'm okay voting for the food truck park. And if they can operate at 40% uh, uh, from non-alcohol sales, you know, then that, that would be equal footing to uh, Katie Trail Ice House and, and, and other businesses. So I, 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 I could vote for that. Are we, are we saying that at this point, we are keeping the status quo as to the zoning yeah. currently for... We would be voting for an SUP for food trucks and denying an SUP for a private club. Correct. And your motion recommended. Can we do it separately because I'm not on board with the food truck? You just vote no. Just vote no. <laughs> It would be De yes. Deny the petition. We deny. Rick, what do you? What? My motion was. My motion was not to approve the recommendation with both SUPs. Right. That was it. Both of them. I denied both of them. That was my motion. So do you want to amend it? Not at this time. 
Okay. All right. But I, I, so I, I apologize. I don't want to complicate things, but I actually need to withdraw my second then right. because right. I, I, I would vote for the food truck SUV. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to, to. Okay. Then I'll second. No, it's already. I think no. we withdrew. Yeah. Oh, we do, you, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So I have a motion and a second to deny uh, agenda item number three, and that would be voting yes for it. For clarification, for clarification, mine, mine was on both of them. Yeah. Okay. You're right. Okay. So, right. so, so, sorry, point of clarification. We vote no unless we want to deny both SUPs. Correct. Correct. All right. Yeah. Want to deny both, you vote yes. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, but if we don't want to deny both, you vote yes. Please vote. Julie, vote how do you yes. vote? Yes. Julie votes yes. Yes. Okay. Motion passes 4-2. Four, 5-2, four, excuse me. Motion passes to deny five to two. All right. Ready for agenda item four. <laughs> Public hearing and consideration of an ordinance to, as requested in zoning case 2023-14 to amend Article 8 definitions, Article 14 allowed uses and use <laughs> classifications, Article 15 use specific regulations, and Article 16 parking and loading of the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended to allow commercial drone delivery hubs and to include provisions for advanced air mobility aircraft and providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. We, oh, go ahead. I, I, was, I was going to explain our, where we're at right now. Mr. We, Mayor, I, I like to make a motion to table at this well, time. Well, hold on. Let me explain our position. Just a second. Okay. We, we, uh, we had an opportunity as a council to meet in person to see the operations in two different areas, one in Frisco and one in Plano. Uh, unfortunately, it was a couple of days before Thanksgiving, so we had a lot of us gone. Um, we, would, uh, we still need some of that information, and so we're respectfully hoping that we can table this item, get some... Uh, real video that, that can be analyzed and explained to us. I think that's our best hope to, to get all of us together outside of this venue. So um, uh, if the council is agreeable to that, I'd, uh, I'd like to save everybody some time and I appreciate your, uh, your patience tonight. But uh, if we could get that information and come back with a uh, a much better understanding of what you're asking for. I'll let you speak in just a second, sir. Um, is everybody okay with that? As, as far as making a motion? Would that be instead of, you know, I know we had difficulty trying to get a quorum to visit a site. Would that video would yes. serve as a, to supplant that instead of yes. replace that. But okay. we'd, we'd have the opportunity to to have the video with the applicants explaining their point of view. So I think I think we can all figure that out. I'm sorry. May, you Mayor, do that. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I was going to say, if I would not be against doing it. I was on the road, so I would oh, not do it. But if we could do it before we get too close to the holiday period, I would I would rather see it in person because my, one of my concerns is the noise being generated and the video will get some of it, but it's not going to really give you the same impact as you being there as our neighbors and other people might be who would be in direct flight paths. I I I totally agree, but the act of getting all of us together has yeah. been very just difficult. Thought, yeah, if, <laughs> and if and if we can work, we're, we're not too much like cats. Sometimes we can be herded. You know, we just take sometimes we can, but. Very rarely. Yeah. <laughs> so Maria, I already made a motion for okay. um, to yep. table. 
Second. Second. Okay. In order to preserve the notice, we need to table to a date certain. So is that um, would that be the eleventh or the nineteenth? The 11th, uh, what date would you like? The In January, you've got the 8th or the 22nd. I think she's talking about January. Are you talking about, talking January? about January or the 11th of December? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. The, okay, zoning cases, we didn't notice any to that date, so that's why I don't have that. <laughs> Which? December 11th or 19th, would you like the latter? Or January, we can go to January. If you want an in-person meeting, that's why I was suggesting those January dates. Sorry, uh, thank you very much for your consideration. I'm Scott Shoffman from the Association for Uncrewed Vehicle Systems International, AVSI. I, I work with a number of these drone delivery companies, and our initial ask was actually going to be for either late February or early March to make sure we could deconflict oh. with council schedules. So, just for clarity. But. Okay. Well, we can we can we can do that. I don't have a calendar that far ahead. Um, but Christina, do we do we need to do we need to make that date right now? So I okay. could amend my motion yes. to table the, uh, to sometime in February at our, one no, of our I meetings. They, I've, I've got date the February twenty sixth yeah. meeting. Would February okay? twenty sixth. I think we can work with that. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right, February twenty sixth. February twenty sixth. Table to that date. I second okay. Then, yeah. Now, thank you, thank you a lot. Thank you. Mr. Lagos, you want to come up and speak real quick? Please. Thank you very much. My name is Jack Lagos. I live in the city of Plano. I've been waiting here for two hours to make a comment on the thing you just tabled, which I agree with, which is strange me coming up to say something. But for the person on the overhead, if they can shoot down what's on here, I think you all read the newspaper, especially when it concerns Plano. Or do you? Yes. I'm, I'm making a, an assumption. We okay? Do. We I do. get the Plano newspaper, and in the metro section, which is here, that's the, it that's has the to Dallas come in about news. Plano. Harvey? That's the Dallas Morning News. Hmm? That's the Dallas Morning News. Dallas Morning News that has a metro section. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, does it make a difference? I mean, you would want no, to have well, Plano. the Plano paper. I just wanted to Oh, clarify. okay. Well, I'm referring to the Plano paper. That's, that's a misnomer. Uh, okay. I'm bringing it up here to show you. I read on what you folks are talking about tonight. As soon as I read on it, I called one of your staff members. And I started asking questions of them. All right? Now... I have another document here that I can share you with you is on Plano letterhead. And I can put it on the overhead, but the letterhead uh, letter sent to Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas, and sent to uh, Walmart on Custer and Parker stated they were violating a, they were violating the drone, or it actually was the storage that pertains to the drone. In that picture you're seeing up here, it shows the drone flying over with something that actually is dropped down at that Custer and Parker location. And I believe, based on your, your land usage or storage usage, or whatever you call it, they put it in an uh, 18-wheeler trailer out in front of the Walmart, which, again, I don't think you folks allow. So I'm sitting here reading this and trying to understand how is the city of Plano allowing this? In other words, these people are breaking something that you haven't passed yet, but they're breaking it anyways. Okay, that's what this article says. That what got me incensed, and I start calling the staff member. How is it a company called Drone Up, plus there's three other companies similar to this one, that are doing things that you haven't even passed an ordinance on? Is that the way we run government? Now, you're going to go look at it in January, wherever time it is, but in the meantime, these people are breaking something that you're supposed to be regulating. As a citizen, it gets me a little upset because seconds. if Jack Lagos did that, I'd be in handcuffs and probably in the jail, all right? But if uh, Drone Up does it, which I understand is a big company out of Virginia, it's okay. The other company, which you may recognize, I don't know, Walmart does it, and nobody pays attention to it. 
Now, this letter I'm holding right here is on plain of lettering. It said to Walmart, both the one in Bentonville and the one here, you have 12 days to correct the problem on this picture. This letter is dated June, uh, let's see, June 1, 2023. And it says, if you don't correct it in 20, uh, let's see, if you don't Mr. correct Lagos. it in, in uh, Mr. Lagos, June 14th. Your time, your time's up. My time's up. I think you understand. I do. You folks run the, the, the city. I don't. You need to get your act together and run the city correctly. Thank Is that you. okay? Yes. All right. Yes. Thank Good you. Good night. I can't see her. She's there. It's. I think she. Might I'm sorry. Be. I'm here. It's just really dark. I'm in a cab. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're dark. Um, do you vote to table? Well, I, well, she's she's on camera. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Six zero. We can't see her, so let's move on. Item five. A light in there? Yeah, I know. Hey, I know. Can you oh, that's see me now. Is that better? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I see you now. Okay, I'll turn it on when I vote. <laughs> okay. Just stay ready. <laughs> Item nine. All right, I'll be ready. <laughs> Item number five, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2023-24 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2, as heretofore amended, granting specific use permit number 61 for public service yard on 5.2 acres of land located 25 feet north of Technology Drive and 700 feet west of Shiloh Road in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, presently zoned Research Technology Center, directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city, providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. All right, this is our last zoning case of the evening. We have a request for a specific use permit for a public service yard. It is for DART and uh, along the Silver Line near the Shiloh Road Station. Um, you can see the length of this uh, service yard within the right-of-way, uh, just to the west of Shiloh Road uh, in the Research Technology District, um, and the area that of notices that went out. Here's an aerial showing you the surrounding land uses. Um, there is a variety of land use in this area um, with the Research Technology District having um, primarily warehousing and manufacturing type uses and then a good variety of uses to the north. This is a preliminary site plan that was submitted by DART showing you the maintenance facility along the right-of-way uh, in blue. Then just for reference, you can see the, they connect in the right, to the right-of-way through the parcel that's outlined in red, um, and that connection is through to Technology Drive. And then this is a revised preliminary site plan for Hematronics Edition, and that is a lease. They have a long-term lease on this property, and that's how the site will be accessed. So uh, DART will be utilizing this property as um, an office building and parking for the adjacent site. So because of that, the necessary parking is provided at the time of site plan review. That's 
an important SUP restriction because there isn't parking for otherwise for the uh, maintenance facility. We also are requiring a sound wall to be constructed on an, the north side of the public service yard facility because of the uses that may be sensitive to the north, such as a, um, a retirement housing facility there. And then equipment maintenance facility and wash buildings are going to be full, fully enclosed. And again, that's to cut down on noise that may impact adjacent uses. So regarding conformance with the comprehensive plan, uh, you can see this is part of the employment centers, uh, future land use category on the land use map. It does meet the uh, various categories within that future land use category. We had no responses, though you could see a wide variety of people were notified on this. So it was recommended eight to zero by the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, based on the three restrictions before you, and we are available for questions. Any questions for Christina? Okay, thank you. Open the public hearing. Um, the only speakers we have this evening are the applicant, Trey okay. Walker. Good evening, everybody. My name is Trey Walker. I'm the Vice President for Capital Design and Construction with DART. I'm here this evening to speak on behalf of DART. Uh, for this zoning case uh, that's before you. Before diving too deeply into this, I do want to talk a little bit about the Silverline project as this is integral to our efforts that were taking place on the, on the Silverline. Uh, the Silverline itself is a commuter railroad that is currently within is currently under construction. We are about the 50% stage of construction, and we have hopes to open the service uh, in early 2026, if not sooner. The corridor spans from BFW Airport uh, Terminal B to the west, uh, all the way to Plano in the east, uh, making connections uh, through Grapevine, Capel, Carrollton, Addison, Dallas, Richardson, and eventually terminating in Plano. Now, unlike the uh, DART light rail fleet that's currently on the rails on the red and orange lines that serve here in Plano, the vehicles for this service as a commuter railroad are different. They are internally powered uh, by diesel uh, engines. That means you don't see the overhead catenary lines that you see right now, they're kind of uh, all around our, our railroad network. So with being a different engine and different vehicle, we do need a separate place to maintain these, these vehicles for uh, maintaining service, which brings up the zoning case before you this evening. So um, ideally these, uh, these uh, facilities would be located within our right of way um, or adjacent to our right of way and be able to easily uh, provide uh, the necessary services of servicing, cleaning, inspecting, maintaining our vehicles. So on the item for you tonight, our request is for uh, approval no, which will, of this item, which will, facilitate, uh, uh, which will facilitate the construction of this maintenance facility. This location uh, that has been identified is ideal, uh, and it was selected because all um, efforts can be fit within the existing Silverline right-of-way, um, so it can accommodate all of our efforts. There, uh, the location is also very close to our end of line of operations, uh, which makes this operationally very efficient, um, limiting any unnecessary non-revenue revenue train movements and maximizing the efficiency of our corridor. Um, the DMUs uh, that we have that will operate this service will be stored on site. We have eight vehicles, four of which are in North Texas uh, currently, and then the other four will be shipping in early 2024. So all eight vehicles will eventually be stored on this facility uh, and will be serviced by a maintenance, uh, a maintenance facility, uh, and a wash building. It's our intention to build the storage yard in advance of the, uh, of the facility, and as staff noted, we do intend to build a 15-foot tall sound wall uh, along a portion of the Silver Line corridor uh, to mitigate any impacts uh, due to noise. The site itself, as highlighted previously, I just orient you, Technology Drive is on the southern uh, bottom of the page with Shiloh Road just off the page to the east. Um, this is an existing railroad right-of-way, about 2,000 feet long and up to about 150 feet wide, spanning just over five acres. As noted, planning and zoning unanimously approved this item on November 6th uh, with three conditions, that we provide the necessary parking um, at the time of site plan review, that the sound wall be constructed on the northern edge of the right-of-way, 
and that uh, the equipment maintenance facility and wash buildings be fully enclosed. It's DART's intention to meet all three of these conditions. And we are actually uh, in the process and have an agreement uh, with the current property owner at 3201 Technology Drive to purchase that facility and look forward to closing on that property uh, either later this year or in January. Some existing siding photos of the right-of-way uh, and the area. This is looking out the back parking lot of 3201 onto the Silver Line right-of-way. The top photo is looking east, which is where the area of the storage are will be placed. Uh, looking straight ahead is the middle photo. And then looking uh, to the west, uh, where you'll enter the yard and have the uh, EMF facility as well as the wash building will be located on the west. Uh, and that's depicted current conditions in the bottom photo. The structures and layout on the site, on the western edge, we will have a wash building. So just imagine a large car wash um, to, to clean the exterior of the vehicles. The vehicles will pull through on a rail and then enter the maintenance facility itself, which will be supported by two tracks, uh, being able to work on two vehicles at once within this facility, uh, and access points below the vehicles and above the vehicles uh, housed within this building footprint. Uh, as you move east, we will then have a fuel canopy uh, to be able to service the vehicles uh, and fuel them prior to uh, storing them in the service yard uh, to, the, to the east, uh, which will be supported by four tracks connecting to the Silver Line main line. Zooming out a little bit further, just for context, uh, we do have, um, again, just to, to get you oriented, that the, at the very top of the image, you see a bold line. That is the sound wall that is currently uh, planned for construction with our main line construction. So we plan to meet that condition in advance uh, of starting construction on this facility. Uh, the red and blue lines at the top of the page are the silver line main line tracks. And then the purple uh, tr lines within the upper quadrant of the page notate the yard track uh, that moves throughout the buildings um, and serves the fleet. We will be providing site access to the maintenance facility through the 3201 parcel. We have those two gray cutouts that are shown at the top of the page. And we'll be providing fire access along 3201 and also on 20, uh, 2801 Technology Drive. And we're in the process of securing long-term easements for those facilities. Just to walk through a few renderings real quickly. Um, the wash facility is the, is the building uh, on the bottom of the page, kind of in the bottom center with the maintenance facility uh, being in the middle of the page, extending into the service yard um, on the on the top of the page with the four tracks there. The sound wall is shown with the brown uh, stripe in about the middle of the page running uh, from the bottom left to the top right of the page as well uh, on the other side of our tracks. Turning around a little bit, this image highlights those, um, those uh, the ability to make deliveries to the maintenance facility through 3201 Technology Drive. We have those two cutouts there. Looking back to the west, you can see the tracks as they enter uh, the yard and into the into the wash bay. And the uh, nursing uh, home facility is located uh, kind of at the top page of the page with the asterisk. And you can see the, the sound wall that fully encompasses the front edge of that property. This is looking at the backside, looking south on the property as well. I will note that the path that is on the left part of the image, that is the Cotton Belt Regional Trail. That is a partnership project that is sponsored by the Council of Governments. Uh, it's taking place and being constructed on DART property and then ultimately operated and maintained by the independent cities uh, along the corridor um, to support uh, to recreational use in and along um, that uh, trailway there. We do want to elevate a little bit the uh, aesthetics of the property. So we are looking to uh, include uh, windows for the maintenance facility itself uh, and, and lighten that feel up a little bit. This, this structure will be visible along the Silver Line mainline tracks. So if you're riding out to Shiloh Road, you will bypass this facility. So we do want it to look nice um, and kind of mirror that tilt panel construction that's in the area, uh, but add those windows, add some canopies, and add a little bit of architectural reveals uh, as we go around the facility. And of course, uh, notated with DART uh, branded signage. This shows against those access points that we have in the rear of the property of 3201. And then in general, just the use of the site. It is, we do have a, um, driveway paved uh, fully around the property to be able to access and provide equipment uh, entrances along um, along the, the near side of the property as well as on both ends. A little bit of specifications on the noise wall that we're providing. Uh, this is to protect adjacent property owners from any noise pollution. Um, this is, wall is 15 feet above top of rail, so it's actually a little bit higher than 15 feet, uh, but it does extend for 650 feet. 
The interior of these panels um, have an, a sound absor absorbent material, think of like a cork or something to be able to capture the waves that propagate through any sound that comes from that. And the outside has an architectural finish um, so, that, uh, so that it looks nice. And it does face, again, sort of the trail that will be constructed along uh, parallel to the, to the Silver Line right of way. So tonight we asked the council to approve zoning case uh, 23, uh, 2023-24 uh, to allow DART to build this maintenance facility. Uh, DART, with this approval, DART will advance plans to locate both our Silver Line operations and our maintenance contractors as well as some DART staff uh, on this site uh, at 3201 Technology Drive, which will bring an approximate full-time employment of about 65 individuals to this location. Additionally, uh, the, the capital savings uh, to be able to locate with under one roof with all of our contractors here uh, will save about uh, $30 million to, uh, to DART and its member cities, as well as $1 million in annual operating fees uh, or annual operating costs uh, related to additional fuel and deadhead trips that are not necessary with us being located at the end of the line. So the location here is very ideal. Uh, we have minimized any neighborhood impacts uh, and find, uh, through compatible land use and ensuring that uh, the service buildings are fully enclosed and that we will be installing the sound wall to mitigate any impacts to noise. Thank you very much for your time and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Just real quick, is this the only maintenance facility for the Silver Line? For the Silver Line, yes sir. Okay, thanks. That's the plan. Any other speakers? Oh, okay. All right. I'll close the public hearing, confine the comments to the council. Motion to approve. Go ahead. Well, hold on. Okay, go ahead and ask. Question for either Christina or Paige. I know we've had some challenges on some of our um, dark properties with trash and maintenance of the of the land being well kept so what legal stipulations could we put in place to require them to um, maintain the land around this I think we already have code provisions that deal with that type of issue right I, I do think that I'm not sure what we could, I think I'd have to think about what we could do above and beyond code, um, unless you have something specifically in mind, or if DART might have something to offer regarding maintenance. Yeah, it's more around, um, I was thinking regular maintenance to ensure that, because I know especially around the Parker Station being at the end, a lot of trash gets built up there. I don't, you know, trash cans right. overflowing, things like that. I want to make sure being at the end of this line as well mm -hmm. that we don't get a, a similar problem, especially with having a maintenance facility out here. We could, we could put something with regard to, I just want to make sure anything that we put in there is something that property standards can enforce right. readily. Requiring additional dumpsters, or I don't know what's required right now, but... The mayor and council, I, I know that we've had discussions with, with DART staff with regard to some of the stations and, and some of the maintenance and, and upkeep issues because um, the amount of litter and abatement has been noticed definitely at, at Parker Road. I think part of that is is continued um, communications from our staff to them, but I, I do think that anything that we can have DART commit to as far as enhanced levels of, of cleanliness and um, partnership would uh, would be appreciated. And whether that's on an operational level or whether it's in the zoning, um, we're happy to continue to pursue that to make sure that we are uh, getting that level of maintenance and that this it, um, becomes an asset, not an eyesore uh, within the community. Just to note, note on this facility specifically, this is, uh, this is not a public facing facility. This will be uh, internally maintained just to our operations and maintenance contractors. So, of course, we'll hold those standards to, to our employees. This is, not a, this is not like a station that is public facing. Yeah, I, I think it's just, you know, it, it's right next to a trail and it, 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 there, 
people, you know, employees, anybody, you know, that comes down there gets off, they can, you know, throw trash out. So we've seen it with Parker Road. And so I just would hope that we can do a better job at all of the Plano locations of so, Mayor Pro Tem, perhaps we could uh, approach uh, Dart about entering into an MOU with with the city as far as uh, maintenance standards out there. And uh, I can see Jack nodding his head because he is readily accepting this as an assignment to go uh, pursue an MOU with them to make sure that the the maintenance is where it should be. Awesome, Rick. You you had a motion, but I'll let you do it again if you'd like. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to approve as long as. Deputy City Manager Jack Carr will get with DART and get an <laughs> MOU that will affect and keep our place clean for Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. That's a motion. Thank you. I'll second that. <laughs> I'll second that motion. Boy, that's a long motion. But well, we'll go ahead and go with it. Julie, are you there? You There's her live. All right, we're good. I think Christina wanted to say something. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to approve it subject to the approval of the MOU? I would love to do that. Sure. Are you okay with that? All right. Okay. Is that, do you, does he have to say it? He has to amend his motion. Just clarify, I think. Just clarify. You did. Yeah. Uh, motion to approve with uh, the stipulation that we develop an MOU with uh, DART to maintain the cleanliness of the facility. Okay. I'll re second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve agenda item number five with the stipulations. Please vote. Julie, how do you no, vote? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, now we have seven to zero this time. All right. Thank you, Trey. Appreciate Thank you very it. much. Appreciate you. Item six. Is that where we're at? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Item number six, second reading and consideration of an ordinance to amend section one of ordinance number 2014-6-11 to extend the non-exclusive franchise granted to CoServe Gas Limited, a Texas limited partnership doing business as CoServe Gas to furnish and supply gas to the general public in the city of Plano, Collin, and Denton counties, Texas for the transporting, delivery, sale, and distribution of gas in and out of and through said municipality for all purposes, and providing a repealer clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and City Executives. I'm Michelle Warner, Senior Policy and Government Relations Analyst. This is the second reading of an ordinance to extend the current terms and conditions of a, the franchise agreement for five more years with CoServe Gas to construct and operate a gas distribution system in Plano's public right-of-way. The first reading was held at the October 9th City Council meeting. CoServe provides approximately 3% of Plano's gas infrastructure with the other 97% with Atmos Energy. Under the franchise agreement, Plano will receive from CoServe revenue in the general fund from quarterly franchise fee payments based on 5% of gross out revenues from each retail customer. In the most recent fiscal year, the franchise revenue Plano received from CoServe Gas was approximately $186,000. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any, any questions for staff? Have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to, to approve agenda item number six. Please vote. Julie? I vote yes. Yeah. Thank you. So it's seven, seven to zero. Motion passes. Item seven. Item number seven, consideration of a resolution for the city of Plano to cast its ballot for the election of members to the Collin Central Appraisal District Board of Directors under the provision of the property tax code authorizing the mayor to execute the ballot for and on behalf of the city of Plano and providing an effective date. And okay. So we just need to cast its 299 votes for Collin County and the list of candidates were uh, was included in your packet. So if you guys have, have seen the list on Collin 
county central appraisal district, we, we could, there's two, uh, there's uh, Rick Grady and Ron Kelly, and we could split those 299 evenly or almost evenly between the two of them, if you guys are okay with that. <laughs> you could, which one do you want? You, huh? Okay. Uh, if, if that's okay. All right, so it would be uh, uh, for Rick Grady, 149, and for Ron Kelly, because he's done it, uh, 150, very close. Is everybody okay with that? All right. I, I, I will, since uh, I have to sign it, I'll make a motion to uh, approve Rick Grady with 149 votes and Ron Kelly with 150 votes for the Board of Directors nominations. I'll second. I have a motion and a second to approve agenda item number seven. Please vote. I vote yes. Thank you. <laughs> motion passes seven to zero. Um, next item. Item number eight, consideration of a resolution for the city of Plano to cast its ballot for the election of members to the Denton Central Appraisal District Board of Directors under the provision of the property tax code, code and authorizing the mayor to execute the ballot for and beyond and on behalf of the city of Plano and providing an effective date. And for Denton County, we have a total of 12 votes um, and the list of candidates was in your packet. Anybody recommend uh, anyone on this list? I'm, I'm going to have to admit that I don't know any of them. Does anybody make a recommendation on any of these uh, nine? I don't have a recommendation. I was just going to suggest that uh, I know we've done this before, and so there is probably somebody on this list, though. To be honest, it's been a while, and I can't recall who we, we may have uh, voted for previously. Is, is the, the previous person on this list that we voted for, or would you remember that, Lisa? I don't have that information. Typically in the past, you've kind of voted in alignment with Louisville ISD because they have Hebron High School, and they have nominated Roy Atwood, Alex Buck, um, and, and Pomichol? Mm-hmm. Those are the three that they know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> would, you, would you like to do that? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion that we, uh, uh, th that we split our votes and go along with Louisville ISD. Four votes for Roy Atwood, four votes for uh, Alex Buck, and four votes for Ann Pomichol. Couldn't be, couldn't be better. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. I'm it. All right. Thank you. Please vote for agenda item number eight. <clears throat> Motion passes seven to zero. Comments of public interest. Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And as a reminder, please do not touch or yell into the microphone at the podium. And we do have, um, back to my list, four speakers this evening. The first one is Alexander Stein. The, uh, the city of Plano and this council take the opportunity to hear from our citizens very seriously. We always welcome feedback on how we can make our community better and we take seriously our role as city government and the importance of respecting citizens' time and taxpayer resources. There you are. We conduct ourselves with excellence and focus our agenda on city business in return. We ask that those come before us the same level of respect. Okay, you guys are ridiculous. Well, you know, these scams y'all are trying, oh, my phone, I can't even get my phone right. All right, guys, I'm really frustrated. I got my cat here. You had plenty uh, of time. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't have that much time, Mayor Munns. You guys trying to limit me, make me speak at the end of the meeting. You guys, y'all aren't the first uh, city to try to pull this gimmick. I'll tell you that much, but uh, let me fix the mic. So I'm prime time, 99 hours sign. I'm a pimp on a blimp. You guys know me. I'm suing you, and you're trying to do a little clear. You know, you're trying to be really clever by making me speak at the end of the meeting, but just like your, you know, your balding hair pattern, I'm going to hang on to the very end, Mayor Munns, you know. You can see it really well from up there, how thin it is, but we're not here to talk about your bald head. We're here to talk about pro-taxoplasmosis awareness. I'm sick of all these pregnant women putting their cat at the freaking SBCA. We can't do that. We got to stand up for cat rights. Do you understand that, Mayor Munns? I'm out here doing everything I can for these felines. I love them so damn much, but a lot of people, they don't treat these cats with respect. And I'm telling you, a lot of women are like, oh, I don't want to have a cat while I'm pregnant because I don't want my baby to come out autistic. Listen, don't get pregnant by a drunk guy if you don't want your baby to have, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome. So let's not blame it on the cats. So you guys know I'm a performer just like Anthony Riccadelli. He was in show choir, which I respect, Anthony. That's very, I'm very proud of that. And, um, and I have a lot of colleagues that went to school with a lot of the members here at this uh, council. But so I wrote a song like I usually do, because you know I'm a pimp on a blimp. So it's kind of a poem, song-esque. Why does the cameraman, can you shoot higher up on me so you're not cutting my head? This, you guys got the worst production quality I've ever seen. of any. I know, but Mayor Munns, you're doing this on purpose. You guys don't want to show my beautiful face. You guys don't want to get millions of hits on the internet. But I'm doing this. I know, but I, they're cutting my head off, Mayor Munns. That's what I'm saying. See, they got my head. See, if I stand like this, look, if I go to the podium, he got me all messed up. So let me just say, I love cats so damn much. Their furry bodies I love to touch. They poop a lot in a box. Their turds harden like some old ass rocks. The smell is bad and it's very off putting but not as bad as Bill Cosby's pudding. A cat won't ever rape you in the bottom, but they are evil just like Hillary Rodham. The Clinton family drinks cat blood. They worship Satan and love Noah's flood. Cats were worshiped in ancient times because they don't bust you for felony crimes. Drug dogs need to go. Cash it legally allowed to sell blow. Dogs are bitches and cats are hoes. That's why they have sharp blades for toes. Toxoplasmosis ain't that bad. Your baby was already retarded from his dumb ass dad. I don't care if your baby gets seconds. infected. Cats can keep our society erected. All right, I'm Primetime 99, Alex Stein. Uh, Mayor Munns, you guys need to show more love to cats. The whole city needs to stand up for cats. We love this. Kyle, this is my second ranked cat. Sky Bear's gonna be very pissed about this. I'm sorry to Sky Bear. Kyle, you did a great job. You're the real MVP. Thank you, guys. Give it up for Kyle. Look how cute he is, Kyle. Podium cat, get a selfie cat. The next oh, speaker. See you guys is Bigger Barnes. Esteemed colleagues and councilmen, thank you for this opportunity to come here and speak to you this evening. I am here for a very urgent reason. The children of Plano are being misled by a satanic marketing campaign to turn Santa Claus into a homosexual. I will not stand for this. You all are trying to play with Santa. Y'all are going to get the horns because even though Jesus is black, whether you like it or not, that don't mean he was a transsexual too. So y'all need to do the right thing and start perpetuating a black Santa like it should have been long before now. 
and all public display areas in the city facilities and throw away any LGBTQ or gay related Christmas decorations. Santa Claus has always been a black man in my book. And if you all think I'm making a joke, what does Santa do? He likes to break and enter places illegally at night and black people are the best at breaking and entering at night. What does Santa like to do? Steal from the rich and give to the poor. That's exactly what Santa does. He steals from the corporations like Target and gives it to Latino and Asian kids who get good grades. As you know, African Americans really struggle with type 2 diabetes. So you know we be fat at eating cookies all damn day, just like Santa. A lot of people have accused me of being bisexual, and that's fine, but I'm not about to have a bisexual Kris Kringle coming into my children's living room, trying to do drag queen story time next to the Christmas tree while trying to give them some free candy and presents. That sounds like something Chris Hansen predator stuff, if you ask me. A black man don't ever be a pedophile, really. So we seconds. need to stop letting these white pedophile Santa Claus all up in these children's houses singing drag queen Christmas carols. Santa Claus need to go back to being a scary ass black man that don't got no gas, so that's why he gots to ride on reindeers. And no, I don't think elves are slaves, but I know y'all politicians are basically white slave masters. Your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Tiny Allen Cross. Hello, my name is Big Nasty, and I'm one proud, strong black man today because my cousin, Devontae Jefferson, was the inmate that stabbed Derek Javin in prison. The only thing that I'm mad about is that my cousin Devontae was not able to finish the damn job and end, and end Derek Chauvin's life. I'm a proud member of the Black Lives Matter, and I will always stand up for the rights of black women and children. George Floyd may have been murdered unjustly by a racist cop, but his legacy will always be remembered in the same name as Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King Jr. I am here in front of the Plano City Council demanding that my cousin, Devante, be pardoned for the attempted murder of Derek Chauvin. Devante may be in jail for life already because of a bad batch of fentanyl that he sold to the cartel, but he should not be prosecuted for the attempted murder of Derek Chauvin. Shoot. I believe that we should just erect a new statue of my cousin Devante stabbing uh, Derek Vaughn Chauvin right next to the George Floyd Monument in Houston, Texas. But I know since y'all in Plano, maybe y'all can make a Devante Monument outside this joint right out here. I have to be honest, though. I do be gambling, gambling at the legal poker houses in Plano, and I do be winning. But I talked to the manager, Gary, and he said he would uh, be willing to donate to my cousin's commissary in prison. And I thought that would be a great idea if any of the council would like to support my cousin Devante and put up some money in his prison books. You can cash me a dollar sign, Black Jack Dallas. Again, let me repeat it. That my cash app is money sign, Black Dallas, Black Jack Dallas, all one word. All the proceeds go to my cousin Devante, and we will make sure next time that the job gets done and we will finish Derek Chauvin ass like the video game Mortal Kombat. I noticed on Twitter a lot of people trying to say that George Floyd overdosed and Derek Chauvin is not responsible, but y'all be smoking crack because my fentanyl is not the reason George overdosed. He had a strong tolerance. I know a lot of people that have done fentanyl 
and turned out just to be fine. And uh, stop blaming that instead of Derek Chauvin. I just wanted my speech with a little word of advice. If you're a racist honky trying to bring the black man down, just forget about it. You ain't never gonna touch a black man's radio and you never should put your feet on a black man's seconds. neck because if you do, uh, you're gonna have to pay the net, the check. Once again, my app, cash app is money sign Blackjack Dallas. I also want to say yes, y'all should free R. Kelly, not because R. Kelly's innocent, but because they might retaliate to try to stab R. Kelly as payback because of white supremacy gang, don't play in prison. Free my boy, Devontae. Rest in peace, George Floyd, and any big booty hoes that want to get in contact with me, just hit my <clears throat> cash app up at Black Jack Dallas. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker is Joya Trevetti. Through here. <laughs> okay, um, good evening. My name is Joy Trevetti, and this is my partner, Oliver Ong, and we are both seniors at Plano West Senior High School. And today we would like to address um, housing affordability. So last spring, my mother asked her Sunday school students one thing they would wish for. Across the room, Eight-year-olds spoke of their dreams about houses with yards, a room of their own, or just a safe permanent place to call their home. This, br sorry, this brought to my attention the magnitude and severity of this problem. So I decided to dig deeper with my friend Oliver to understand the root issues concerning the lack of stable housing in our community. The observational study we are about to present to you to here today um, is not intended to provide you with a solution. Rather, um, we understand that this problem is extraordinarily complex and has been addressed with years of hard work by um, you, our mayor, um, fellow um, established members of the city council, and our local government. We'd simply like to highlight uh, what we have discovered through our work in the hopes that this will contribute towards the continued efforts to provide sustainable housing for all Plano residents. Based on three key factors, we chose two other cities to compare Plano to, the first being San Francisco. It is a strong negative example when it comes to the issue of affordable housing. The primary issue is the excessive regulation uh, placed upon San Francisco housing development. Laws such as votes needed to approve buildings over a certain height and mandatory fees such as transit sustainability and tra childcare fees stymie developers' abilities to provide affordable housing options. The stringent regulations act as barriers to construction, leading to a scarcity of housing units and driving up costs. Furthermore, this has resulted in high land value um, costs and low construction rates, continuing to drive up housing costs at an exponential rate, making it increasingly difficult for lower income residents to find affordable options. Drawing upon the lessons from San Francisco, we advise that Plano uh, would need to carefully advise regu regulatory frameworks in order to ensure they don't inadvertently hinder affordable uh, housing development. So moving to the opposite end of the spectrum, I would like to talk about the city of Charlotte, North Carolina. While having the fastest growing population compared to both San Francisco and Plano, Charlotte is actually the seventh most affordable city within the United States. The reason for this lies in its clear-cut framework the city has established in 2018 named Housing Charlotte. Under Housing Charlotte, there are three main pillars, um, expanding supply, preserving affordability, and supporting family self-sustainability. Under these guiding principles, Charlotte has established effective programs such as a housing trust fund, which has actually contributed approximately 12,000 units over 20 years, which leads us to our major recommendations. Based on our observations for Charlotte, our biggest recommendation for Plano is to establish a trust fund. Charlotte City government, through voter-approved obligation bonds, private developers, investment companies, and faith-based communities, were able to contribute approximately $1.6 billion in 21 years to be used as gap financing for lower development costs. Establishing a trust fund would expedite construction and progress and allow developers to lower rent. We would also suggest exploring other programs such as mortgage assistance, repair, and rehabilitation programs, in addition to potentially expanding the Sector 8 program, which we believe has been underutilized to fight, um, in Plano's fight towards housing affordability. 
Can, can you actually send that to to my email, Mark I at Plano .gov? Because I caught about every third word that you were going. You were going so no, fast. We'll, we'll we'll get you to send this presentation to yeah. to the city. But go ahead and finish. Go ahead and finish. You've okay. waited long enough. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just wanted to summarize by learning from other cities and customizing their policies to fit into our local needs, we can work towards affordable housing for all residents of Plano. We hope we have given you some insight today, despite, you know, the rush. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And thank you guys for, for your patience tonight. Well done. Good job. Well done. You, you can get a job. It was a radio. very nice way to finish <laughs> this meeting. <laughs> just, we made a lot more. It's just, you know. Thank you. That being no further business, we're adjourned. Repairs improve.